Good morning, good evening, citizens of YouTube, fellow travelers. I'm glad to see all of you again. I pray that all is going well for all of you. Welcome again to Albion Brethren Church on YouTube. And uh, I would really just like to say how much I appreciate all of you tuning in and to uh, sharing this time together during these trying times. Um, just a quick announcement. We're planning to start a live stream once a week uh, on Wednesdays, uh, uh, probably in the evening. And uh, we invite you probably for about 45 minutes or so. And uh, just uh, just uh, doing a kind of a, like a live stream Bible study. And if that's something that interests you, you know, uh, you know, we, we invite you to take part in it. We will make sure all the information gets out. Uh, to you concerning that, uh, and uh, just something to to go throughout your week, and uh, maybe help out a little bit. And there'll be opportunity for you to to comment and to interact, and um, so it's not just like these filmed events, but uh, but we're, we're we actually are live, and uh, we can have a discussion together about scripture. So uh, so look forward to it. Our, our midweek Bible study live stream coming up soon so and like i said we'll get the information out to you hopefully you'll enjoy it i know i will but uh anyway uh, uh moving on just as always make sure if you have any prayer requests or anything that uh, that that's weighing upon you or anything that you want to praise the lord for please make sure you let us know okay we'd love to hear from you uh, we'll add you to our prayer list and we will keep you in our prayers for sure and uh Let's, let's always remember, though, when we're pray, praying to the Lord, let's always remember to first give him the glory and the praise for all that he has done. Okay, that's that's so important in, in prayer. A lot of times we just want to jump into prayer and we want to start rattling off our list without remembering that the Lord God Almighty is has done much for us. And uh, a lot of times things beyond, beyond what we had initially prayed for. So let's always remember to offer him our prayers of praise first and then make our requests known to him. All right. So send those in email, text, phone call, whatever, and we will make sure those are added to the prayer list. All right. OK, excellent. Now let's go to our uh, responsive reading this morning and we're going to look in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, a wonderful book. It's a book of wisdom. The ancient world was very uh, enamored with the idea of wisdom. And uh, I, I maybe enamored is maybe the wrong word, but it's they understood the value of wisdom. Uh, it's it's not something you hear talked about hardly at all these days. It's certainly not a, a street side conversation word, wisdom. Uh, a lot of people talk about knowledge and intelligence and uh, and uh, things of that sort. But wisdom, wisdom is the engine which applies all of those things. It, it applies knowledge. It applies intelligence. But knowledge and intelligence without wisdom is it's it's, it's not going to lead anywhere good. Let's just say. So the Lord knows how important. Wisdom is, and it's especially for us as as His followers, as His believers, to be to be seeking of wisdom. Okay, you know the wisdom is what informs our decisions. Okay, more than knowledge. Knowledge, yes, we can have knowledge to do things, but if we have no great knowledge of of whatever uh you know great power technology whatever but if we don't know how to apply that properly if we don't have the wisdom it will lead, it leads to destruction and it the same goes uh, even on a personal level in our own lives you know if we have knowledge of something but we don't have the wisdom to apply it properly especially with our relationships with one another it can really blow up in our face okay, so let's keep that in mind as we read proverbs chapter 9 and we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. Okay, just six verses. There's a lot packed in here. And uh, I invite you to read along with me. If you need to pause for a moment to to find it, that's fine. And just, just restart it and, and read along with me. 
it, it aids with uh, with the memory. All right. Proverbs nine, starting with verse one. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maids and she calls from the highest point in the city. Let all who are simple come in here. She says to those who lack judgment, come eat my food. Drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of understanding. May Almighty God add its blessing to this, the reading of his holy word. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you, O Lord, um, we give you thanks, O Lord, for all that you have done for us. We thank you, Lord, for your all of the things that you have provided for us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and your compassion and your love. Lord, we thank you for taking care of us in so many ways. Lord, especially this this past year, dear Lord, it has really been a trying, trying time. And, uh, and as we look forward to a new year, dear Lord, and we pray that it's better, um, let us also be able to look back, even through the, the morass of this past year, and see, Lord, where you have been at work, where you have been faithful to us, where you have been merciful to us. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all of that, dear Lord, more than we can even say and do. And so, Lord, through through our requests today, whether they be for, for health or finance or personal or relationship, or whatever they might be, dear Lord, may we seek first, dear Lord, your kingdom to do what you would have us do, according to our gifts, our graces, our passions that you've given to us. What you would have us do, O oh Lord, to do your will, to spread your gospel to this world, to leave this world a little bit better than what we found it. We thank you, Lord, in your name we pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, moving on to our message today. We're going to go way back into the New Testament near the end, not quite, but uh, but close to it, to the book of 1 John, well, the letter of 1 John, actually, technically. Um, the one thing we have to remember, especially during this year, okay, we are God's children, okay, and that may seem sound like an elementary thing to say, but remember, we are God's children, and in spite of the fact that this world is under the dominion of the devil and of evil, because we, we know that, that evil is run, running rampant on this planet. Satan is having his way. But even in all of that, you know, instead of wringing our hands or shouting to the heavens or burying our head in our pillows and just saying, you know, I just want to stop the world and, and get off, um, we can know that the the devil and his servants, they cannot touch us. Not where it matters, in the deepest part of it, in our hearts, in our souls, in our, in our very spiritual life. They have no power of us, and, no, and sin has no power over us because of the eternal life we have inherited in Christ and his understanding we have gained. You know, when I was, uh, <laughs> you know, this is... Uh, going to date me pretty well, but uh, uh, there was a song when I was young that was real popular. It was by MC Hammer called Can't Touch This, okay? And it was really a popular song. I, I can't say that I was really into it. I wasn't into that kind of music. A lot of people were, a lot of my friends were, and that's fine, you know, but, uh, but uh, if you have that song going through your mind, or if I put an earworm in you, I, I apologize. I, I think I gave myself an earworm whenever I was preparing this sermon uh, with the with the title, but uh, be that as it may. Uh, but uh, Satan really can't touch us. Okay, I mean he can do things externally. He can attack us. He can attack our bodies. 
But what about our hearts? What about what about our spiritual life? What about those those deepest parts of ourselves? Now let's take a look at what John has to say here in First John chapter five, and we're going to read verses eighteen through twenty one. Okay, John chapter five, uh, verses eight. First John, excuse me, First John chapter five, eighteen through twenty one. Not not the Gospel of John, First John, one of one of the uh, one of the, one of John's three small letters. So. Open your Bible way back to almost the beginning of, of Revelation. You'll find it. So, 1 John 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come, and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. May Almighty God add his blessing to this, the reading of his holy word. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, our Holy Spirit, Lord, we give you thanks and praise, dear Lord, for all that you have done. We thank you for the gift of your word, O oh Lord. We thank you for we thank you for this word, dear Lord, that that uh, that permeates us, changes us into the people that you want us to be. Lord, may it do that. May it change us into the people that that you you want us to be. Lord, we, uh, we, we know how difficult it can be sometimes in living in this world and, and, and dealing with, the, with the, the difficulties of sin and, and, and all of the things that come at us. But Lord, we know, dear Lord, that you are, you are here and you are near. So Lord, we just ask you to Use us, dear Lord, as we learn from this will, from this word, to, to do your will, to be your people, O oh Lord. To spread your good news, your gospel, dear Lord. In your name we pray, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. First of all, John, John starts off with, do not sin. Do not sin. Well, what is it to sin? It comes from the, uh, the 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 Greek word that John uses here is hamartia, and uh, and uh, it means to to miss the mark, to be in error. Uh, it's it's an offense against God. Uh, it's an offense against His law. It's to do wrong. It's to transgress. It's it's the opposite of what God intends. Now, why do you think John was telling his his group? Well, you know what what prompted John? You know, because we have to think about what prompted John to write this. Yeah, we know that the Lord spoke through him, and the the Lord breathed this. This was inspired by the by the Lord. To, to write this, he felt compelled to. But there was a specific thing going on. There must have been something going on that, that was the prime mover for John to, to write this, this, uh, this short letter. Well, apparently, the problem of sin post-baptism uh, was one that needed to be faced by the early church, just like us. You know, the early church was really no different than us in a, in a lot of ways. Yes, culturally and everything and technologically, yes, all those things were completely different. But, but when it comes to the sinful nature and struggling with that, that has not changed. The early church was no different. That's why you have uh, other texts as well in Scripture that, that deal with the idea of, of sin post-baptism, after one has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
And what do I do about those sins that happen afterwards? Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6 discusses it. Hebrews chapter 10, 26 through 31 talks about it. And, uh, you know, this indicates that believers falling away entirely from the faith was not unknown, which did happen uh, from time to time. People just completely walking away from the faith. I mean, that's one of the reasons why the book of Hebrews was written. Is because so many were under pressure to leave this this new faith they had embraced to go back to their old faith because of pressures from their community and from their families okay because they were being practically rendered non people they were, were being rendered almost as if they had died by their families because they had embraced Christ and so there was a great pressure to 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 give this up and to go back and you know, just 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 reintegrate into the family and to the rest of the community. So there was a real there was a real struggle for that. And even later, as as the the persecution as as uh, state persecution uh, ramped up, there was a great there was a great um, uh, temptation to give up the faith once again because. If you did not, there was a lot of very terrible deaths waiting for you. Even today, and this this is not relegated to the dustbin of history, unfortunately, but even today, there's there are believers that have to deal with this sort of stuff even today. Um, I just just I just got word last week, uh, last Sunday, that there was a Nigerian pastor. Uh, who had been arrested? I believe he was killed, and a number of his, a number of his congregation was captured. I believe they were killed, and the rest were, you know, ran off into the bush. Um, but um, this happens. It happened then. It happens now. And and I'm sure that that even now, even in in Nigeria, there are those who are believers who are thinking. You know, do I continue with this this worship of Jesus? Do I continue, or do I, or or is Satan trying to work on them and say, "Oh no, it's not worth it. You need to give it up. You need to, you know, need to give this Jesus up." So there's a, been a long history of persecution and of. of, of, of not only persecution, but of the temptation to give up the faith. That's why we have texts like like what we read today in, in 1 John. It's like, it's why we have text in Hebrews and other areas. Okay. John's warning against sin and the failure to maintain the true faith, the faith that was given to them by the apostles, by the by, by and by people like himself. John shows that while he expects his leader, his readers to walk in the light as sons of God, and we, you know, if you read earlier in John, in in the this the same letter of First John, you'll see him use that 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 terminology, walk as sons of light, um, walk in the light as sons of God. He did not ignore the possibility of some believing but heretically inclined members of his community might become apostate. Okay, they might they might turn. Okay. He was aware of that. As a matter of fact, John had dealt with had dealt with a church split of his own. As you read, if and and I invite you to in your time to to read the the these letters of John, first, second, third John, you, you will see it very very clearly that there there's a uh, a serious church split that 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 happens in that community, and and it's over these sorts of issues. See, what John is saying is develop a family likeness. You know how a son or a daughter looks like, just like his or her, his or her father and mother, you know, or maybe favors one or the other. You know, you, you have that likeness. You know, you, you, you have the, the, the family traits. Well, in a spiritual sense, John is saying one born of God looks more and more like Christ the further on in the faith journey they go. 
you know, that means one of those one of those things is the one of the ways we look like God and we tend to take on his traits is to be without sin, to move further and further away from sin. Okay. Now, I'm not talking about perfectionism. Okay, I don't believe that's possible this side of heaven. I don't think you can re, uh, you know, I don't believe you can achieve perfectionism where you are completely without sin on this side of heaven. And uh, I do not think it's a position of humility to declare such thing. Now we can move towards it and try to get as close to it as possible, but there's always something that's going to be in our way because. We are here in this world. Now, John is affirming new conduct should follow from new birth. Okay. So if we are truly born of Christ, if we truly are taking on his likeness, then our very conduct should change. Now, I'm not saying it changes overnight. Now, some people do. I mean, the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of them and it, it's, it seems it's, it's pretty remarkable. But for most people, it's it's a gradual process. It's 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 step by step, trip by trip. In some cases, you know, tripping along that that path, but but always moving. Sometimes even at a snail's pace, but moving towards Christ, moving towards Him. In Christ, it, this is the thing that even if we're stumbling along the way, it is always. Please hear me. It always possible to overcome evil and do good instead. It is always possible to turn away from sin. Faith is key. Okay, You don't have to fall to temptation. You don't have to. You have a free will. You have the ability. You have, if you follow Christ, you have his Holy Spirit. You do not have to fall into temptation. Now, some temptations are, are a lot stronger and worse than others. You know, the temptation to, you know, to steal a pack of gum, you know, or to, uh, you know, something minor is a lot different than let's say, trying to hold your tongue or, you know, taking a needle and injecting yourself, you know, it's those, those temptations are, are different, but it is always, but we cannot lose sight of the fact that it is always possible to overcome evil. Now, with some of the latter, those things, some of those more serious sinful things you know and i believe with all sinful behaviors we need each other as fellow believers we're not meant to 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 be alone we're meant for community we're meant for each other we're meant to uphold one another we're meant to help one another get through these difficulties if we're being tempted in a certain way that we should be able to to share with one another and help one another to get through these things. That's that's one of the ways that Christ enables us to overcome evil, to say no to sin, to say no to temptations. Because a lot of these things we can't we can't do it by ourselves. They're too strong. You know, if left alone to our own devices, a lot of these things will, they will consume us and they will destroy us. You know, you can't just say no and, and, uh, and, and expect it to go away. We need the help of one another. But that's what the Christian community is for. It's why John is writing this to begin with. He's writing this to a community of believers. The intent is to help one another. To, to stay free from the temptation of, of, of sin. But faith is key. Faith in Christ is the key. That's what it all surrounds. That's what fuels the community. That's what fuels each one of us. It's faith in Christ. 
trusting in him, trusting that he knows us better than we know ourselves and that he is able to keep us free from sin. See, the devil cannot lay hold of you. He cannot, he, he cannot forcibly, he cannot lay hold of you without you giving in to him. Okay? We as believers are of God in a world dominated by the devil. That's, that's, that's in verse 19 right there. And we know that. Look, look at this past year. Can anyone deny that? I don't think so. See, we're part of the family of God. And we're like nomads in a strange land that is not our real home. You know, I mean, maybe you remember hearing stories and readings. I was always fascinated about stories about nomads, um, you know, uh, trekking their ways across uh, these far-flung de deserts and steppes and and uh, area, the just harsh environments of the world, and then yet people are living out there, and they, they and they never stay in one place for long. They never stay in one place enough to establish a city. They set up their tents or their whatever their little. Uh, temporary buildings, whatever they have, and then they, they, uh, then they, after a while, they take it down and they move on. Never really having a real home, and uh, and the uh, the culture and the the food and everything that goes along with the with that nomadic style is uh, is very interesting to me. Perhaps you remember reading, hearing stories about about that, or reading about it in school or something like that. But we, as a family of God, we're like nomads in this world. There's no real place for us to, as believers, to put our roots down, you know, we, we, because there's really nothing outside God that we can truly trust. Okay. We are in the enemy's camp, all right? And we're working from the inside. Not only are we nomads, but we're working from the inside of the enemy's camp, almost like covert ops, you know, like these these thrilling tales, these movies or uh, stories that we hear of, of uh, you know, guys, you know, they're all clad in black and maybe they're wearing night vision goggles and, you know, sneaking through uh, and uh, through enemy territory and, you know, doing reconnaissance and, and without the enemy knowing they're even there. Well, we as believers, we're, we're not, quite, it's not quite that dramatic. I mean, that's my imagination taking off there, but, but, but we are operating on the inside, though. We are in, within the enemy camp, you know. All the while, being nomads, not truly having a true home in this world, a true place in this world. But we're operating on the inside to try to draw as many who are part of that enemy camp into the family of God. Trying to, trying to bring them to a saving knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes it is like covert ops. Sometimes where we find ourselves in a, that we might be the only believer in the group that we're, we happen to be in at the moment. And uh, there's, there's, and that's where, see, we're, we talked about wisdom earlier. The wisdom, trusting in the wisdom of Christ that is given through the Holy Spirit to know what to say, when to say it, or when not to say things. You know, or maybe allow our actions to do more speaking than our words at times. Sometimes that's necessary. You know. We have been given the ability as believers to understand who is true and who is the truth. As it says in verse 20, and that's Jesus Christ. He is truth and he is true. The incarnate God who lived among us and died for us. So even Jesus came into the enemy camp. When he was born on this earth as a, as a helpless baby, just like any one of us. He didn't, he didn't come with an uh, you know, an, an, an army on the back of a horse or, you know, with, with sword in hand and charging in. No, he came in rather covertly. He infiltrated the enemy camp by becoming one of us. And by doing so, had much greater impact than if he would just come blazing from heaven. 
now we know one day he will return and it will be more kind of the blazing kind of return but in order to bring salvation to this world and people to understand him as as the lord of everyone and the messiah he, he came as one of us so he could relate to us he knows our struggles he knows what it's like to be one of us so understanding of who christ truly is has been given to our hearts and minds we who have given ourselves over to jesus and given ourselves over to his his will who have accepted his free gift of grace we gain understanding of who he truly is and we see it in his word and it, it just it pops off the page especially when you read john's gospel not his letters but well it's in his letters for sure but when you read his gospel the very first first verse starts in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god that's jesus the living the very living word of god so we understand who he truly is and why word well word it's spoken it's something it's 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 it, it's it's there's a definite line that, that meshes very well with wisdom you know with with uh, not just knowledge but wisdom and it it's it, it, it and also the idea that god you know that's the way god creates he, cre he created the world, he created the, the heavens and the earth by speaking. Okay. So, understanding who Christ truly is has been given to our hearts and minds. And it should encompass our whole being. And it, it needs to inform our every action that we make. Remember, we are family. All of us who who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of us who who declare His name, who read His gospel and trust in His gospel, who try to live by His word, whether we're here, whether we're here in the West, whether we're in Nigeria, or China, or India, or Russia, Indonesia wherever we find ourselves. We are family. We belong to one another. We are in him eternally. Jesus really is the one true God. And no other in this world comes even close. They just don't. No one else deserves such a title. It is totally unique to Jesus. Um... And that's really what it comes down to. And we, as believers, we must embrace that. And it's hard to do so in a world that values pluralism above all things. That's the way the world looks at things. But as believers, as believers, there's only Christ. There is no other way. And we see that again and again in Scripture. And now that may put us at odds with the world. One of the reasons why we're nomads in this world is because of our stance on Christ. Christ is not just one of many gods. He's above, he's, a, he's, he's separate of them. He's, he has no contemporary. Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Most High God. Now, John closes this, uh, this, um, this, this short section here with a with a curious little sentence thrown in there dear children keep yourselves from idols and now that might seem like well why would John say that after after talking about this you know we're born of God we're part of his family you know trust that Jesus is who he says he is um, you know that we we need one another and that we are to stay away from sin and sin that has no part in us and Satan has no no stronghold over us and then he says, keep away from idols. Is that, he just, did John just throw that in as a kind of a, you know, I'm just going to end the letter with this. And just, just as a, as a, just a kind of an aside, a, 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 why did John do this? Well, it was not thrown in for good measure or as, as an afterthought. Okay. It was not. What John wants us to keep in mind that anything that comes before Jesus is an idol. Anything. 
It doesn't have to necessarily be a, a, a particular image of some foreign god that's carved in stone or cast in bronze or or anything of the sort. Okay, it doesn't have to be. Although it it definitely in, includes that. Any other god that's that's uh, that's that's venerated, even even alongside Jesus, is is it's not right. You can't have Jesus plus something, plus another god. But you can't have Jesus plus anything else either. Anything that comes before Christ is an idol. Here in the West, what are some of the things that we idolize in the West? Think about that. Think about even in your own life. What are some things that you idolize? Maybe you don't think of it that way, but think about what are some of the really, really important things that you hold on to. Or things that you think that are really important. And maybe they are important in of themselves in some ways. But do we put unnecessary importance, undue importance upon these things? Anything that comes before Christ is an idol. Okay. The warning, guard yourself against false gods, you know, guard your, guard your, keep yourself from idols, has in mind as well the foundation and character of the Christian faith itself, as one biblical scholar has noted here, described in 1 John as a whole. It is the maintenance of this faith in the face of heretical opinion, which John is urging upon his members of the congregation. Remember, John is dealing with a heretical element within his own church, which leads to a church split. That happens now. That still happens. Church splits happen all the time. And John, John is trying to get people to, you know, it's, it's like, look, people, look, before you go that direction, please try to remember the character of the Christian faith, the foundations, you know, the maintenance of the faith that has been given to us, in, informed by Scripture itself. So keeping away from idols very much goes along with what he had just what he had just said in starting at verse eighteen down. It, it's it's part of that because if we have our focus on something other than Jesus, then we leave ourselves open. We leave ourselves open to the temptations of the devil. We leave ourselves to, uh, open for temptations to things. We leave ourselves vulnerable. That we and it, and it what ha, ends up happening is we find ourselves drawing away, drawing away from those those faith connections that we need with one another. We find ourselves drawing away from those things that are the best for us, and find ourselves being drawn further into the things that we have idolized. And then we find ourselves open. Satan. Accept no imitations, because anything other than Christ that we idolize, anything that's it, it's an imitation. You know, and that's that's always the 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 thing in, in commercials, right? You know, accept no imitations. You know, don't don't go for the knockoff brand. Get the real brand. You know, you'll pay a little bit more, but it'll be better quality. It'll be you know you know the the whole drill. But there's no generic brand of Jesus. You know, there's no generic Jesus version. You know, the, the, there's no watered down version. Although there's many who would like to do that these days, but there there isn't one. Okay. Only the real deal is available. And following Jesus is not easy. It's not. Being the bearer of his truth is not easy. Look what it does. It turns us into nomads in this world. Where we don't really belong anywhere truly. It puts us at odds with this world and its systems and its ways and its philosophies and its in its own views and its own moralities. It puts us at odds with it. I mean, why does a why does a pastor in, in Nigeria get hunted down and his congregation get hunted down for, for just simply gathering? To worship the Lord Jesus Christ, hunted down by the Boko Haram. Why? 
Certainly not because they're popular. Why in China are, are people, you know, huddled in, in, in shuttered rooms around, you know, the few scraps of, of scripture that they can find? Accept no limitations. Only the real deal is available. That's Jesus himself. Guard yourself. Now, that can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can, that's not something we can gird up in of ourselves, but we can trust. We can say, Lord, I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to stop trusting so much in these other things that I hold near and dear, that I, that I idolize. And when I'm, I'm going to set those aside for a while and set those aside and put those in their proper place. Put you first, Lord. Put your will first, your kingdom first. Your gospel first. And these other nice things that we have, you know, th th those come in a very distant second. Guard yourself. As, as Jesus said, because your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion looking for whom he may consume. Okay. But you belong to Jesus. You have a good faith community around you, and you have faith in him, and you put your trust in him. Satan cannot touch you. No, he can he can he can he can bring things to your body. He can there there can be bad things that can happen in your life. That's true. But he cannot have your soul, he cannot have your heart. He cannot have who you truly are. It's off limits. Because Jesus is there. And Jesus will not allow him to have that. No matter what Satan does to us externally, he cannot have us, or truly who we are internally. He cannot have our hearts. But guard yourself. It's a per there's a personal effort, effort. It's a conscious act. And it's, it's based in trust in Jesus. Faith in him. That he is, that he is able. I and myself, I am not. I am weak. I'm a human, it's weak, but it's in him that I'm strong, and in him I put my trust, and I pray that for you today, that you can put your trust in him as well, to say no to the devil, to turn from, from temptations, to know that it is possible to flee from temptation, to embrace Christ. And to keep away from those things that would draw you away from Christ, the very source of your strength, to keep to to keep things in our life in their proper place, to not raise things to the level of idol. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, our Holy Spirit, Lord, thank you so much, Lord, for your word, for your grace. For your mercy, your peace, your guidance, your love. Lord, it can be difficult, very difficult to, to, to live in this world, dear Lord, that uh, that's, Satan runs rampant. And that there's so many temptations, there's so many temptations just to join the world and to just go with the flow. So many temptations just to, to, to idolize the things in our life instead of, you know, elevating you. But Lord, I ask you, in your precious name, dear Lord, that you give us the strength, your strength, dear Lord, that we may carry on and do as you have called us to do. Yes, we may be strangers in a strange land, but Lord, the, the, the devil cannot touch us. He cannot tear us away from you. Whether he, no matter if he attacks our bodies and attacks our, our anything, but he cannot have us. Because we belong to you, O oh Lord. Let us cling to that. In your precious name we pray, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, as always, check out the description box below uh, for this week's featured video from one of the wonderful, talented people here on YouTube. And now, my dear friends, may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with your spirit. 
both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Love and serve the Lord.